Priscilla Joseph and Seehausen, Ego Skaugama, Gigini Taugan, Egwegi, Wigituan, Stay Sipi. My name is Priscilla Joseph. I was born on the Ataku Preserve, married into the Big River Reserve, been off uh, reserve literally um, most of my life because of. Uh, student residence and going to school and working in the city, live in Prince Albert, but have ongoing contact with my home communities and all the First Nations communities around there. Do a lot of ceremonial stuff uh, with com communities and uh, that's life, that's me. I believe giving them that space and freedom like uh, Always uh, my way is one way, but if who cares? It's the child's way and the chi where the child is at, that's where you need to meet them. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandchildren always had these, the uh, great saying, what are my options? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's sit down. You figure out your options and look at them because I think we need to give that space. We're listening. Again, the elders teaching is you have two ears but one, one mouth, mm. so learn to listen. And I think we need to learn to uh, listen to uh, the little ones mm -hmm. and let them learn. That's part of learning. Well, I think within the uh, traditional family system, you have God the Creator on top, and then you have your elders. Mm -hmm. Then you have parents. It doesn't say fathers, mothers, or male or female. It says parents, mm -hmm. and then the gifts, the children. Mm -hmm. And I think the children are there to offer hope, and also uh, the promise for a, a future and their teachers. You have the adults who are the caregivers and providers and provide protection and food. These are very summarized. Then you have your elders who are the teachers and the caregivers and uh, the huggers. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to be cuddled by an elder. <laughs> and, um, and then I've got God the Creator, mm -hmm. and however you worship is fine. Mm -hmm. I always say, look at the telephone and the TP poles, mm -hmm. they're tied together, going different directions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they're all pointing up. Mm -hmm. We worship in different ways, they're all okay. Mm -hmm. And when uh, the smudge came around, uh, you see the smoke going up, those are your prayers going up to the Creator. And then within the roles of the, uh, when we say the uh, number one, or elders, like I say, traditionally were the teachers. Mm -hmm. However, that was eroded with the institutionalization of student residence, for example. And uh, so we had children that no longer uh, had respect for the elders because they were taught, they, weren't, they didn't know anything because they didn't have Western teachings. Mm -hmm. How many years ago I was hearing students again saying, when I tell them, use your elder resources, saying, I don't have any elders in my community. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Mm -hmm. What is, do you define as an elder? Well, none of ours went to school. So you'd sit there and look at the indigenous way of learning and knowing, mm -hmm. and uh, that there are two systems, and how do you build those two today? So I think that uh, that's very important to, to know that. And when we start connecting the elders with the little ones today, mm -hmm. it's powerful. Mm -hmm. And then we have the uh, adults who were the and like I said, providers yes. and uh, provided protection. 
uh, are they providing protection today? And how do they provide protection? And we need to explore that so that our young ones can feel comfortable, protected by the protectors. So we, we learn from the systems that were effective, like the traditional uh, family system versus the Western family system. That's kind of a rough answer. <laughs>
And so for our children, when they're going to school or when they're going to daycare, they're going to a place where they don't have a lot of relatives. And so in that, they're, they're like sh in a strange place. And so relating to them the way we relate to our own children at home is really important. Mm -hmm. At home, we have names for them. And those names become so familiar to them that uh, it's almost like uh, the name carries a lot of honor with it. And they're really just that child's title, which is Tagoja, grandchild. Or um, I remember my grandpa on my dad's side uh, always calling us Sisam. And that's also for grandchild. And so when you are continually calling them just their title, then that tells them this is you, this is who you are in the context of all of our people. And that helps them too to have a sense of belonging. When they come to us, our belief is that they have all the knowledge of the universe. And our job as parents and as grandparents is just not to erase any of that knowledge. We want them to go throughout their life having all of that knowledge. And so to, to nurture that, we put them on a cradle board. And when my son was on a cradle board, I found it was so much more convenient because he's protected inside that cradle board. And when I lay him on the bed, I know he's not gonna go rolling off the bed. But when we were in ceremony, my grandmas would prop him up against the, the back of the lodge and his eyes are at the same level as everybody else in the room. Mm -hmm. And that really gave him a different kind of perspective than a baby that's laying down all the time or not present in some of the really important moments in our lives. And he had that opportunity, even at a time when we think maybe they don't understand or they don't remember, he got the chance to absorb all of that knowledge by being in that upright position in, in ceremony and in, in the lodge. And it was uh, one of his first ceremonies he attended was to receive his name, his official name. He had a name on paper and then he has an official name amongst our people. Mm -hmm. And each person in the room takes a turn of holding him and telling him what his name is and what it means and where it comes from. And as parents, we're sitting there, but we're learning too. We're learning at the same time because people are also telling us so that we can remember for him. And by visiting with each elder in that room, he's also receiving that blessing of the connection between himself as a, as a person new to earth and his ancestor, his people who are his elders who are living on earth. And he's the connection between the ancestors and the people living on earth. So as he grew, my mother said uh, not to uh, talk to him like he was a baby, but to always speak clearly to him as if he understands because he does. And she also mentioned that uh, when you're talking to your baby, you have to be aware of how does your face look? Because are you like thinking of something else and you're impatient and you look like this? And, and she said, always make your face look like you're happy to see that little person mm -hmm. and make that your habit because they deserve that. They deserve to know that when they're present, people are happy that they're present. I think that we are trying to instill the values of caring. That's one of the first ones. I, when my son had his own children, he used to uh, be really challenging to, the, to his son. And I kind of felt like, ooh, I, I don't like that. I don't want him to do that. But one of our teachings is that it's not my place to tell him how to parent especially while he's in the process of parenting. And I have to let him be the adult and I have to trust him 
that what he's doing, he's doing with a good heart, which I know that he was. And so when he challenged them when they were little, or maybe use a louder voice than I, than I would have used, uh, what I learned was they would respond to it. He was eliciting a response. And I really felt uh, humbled in that I think I'm always right. <laughs> because when you're a parent, you kind of, you want to be right. <laughs> you want to be right. And you want to think that you're doing things right. But the way he was doing it, he was teaching them a way of communicating that I, I hadn't ever taught to him. And I kind of felt like maybe that was because I'm a woman and maybe this is the way men communicate, <laughs> I don't know. But there are different ways. And with different people, we're communicating differently. And that's something that trust, if we let that happen, then we're there, right? So we're protecting, but we're trusting that they can learn to relate to different people in different kinds of situations. People who communicate differently, it can't just be all one way of communication because as human beings, we all have our own way of expressing ourselves. I really think that to raise healthy children in a holistic and spiritual way, you have to have those characteristics as a parent. It doesn't mean you have to have them before, but it means when you become a parent, you become especially aware of that. And if there's any area that you think you need help with, that's the perfect time to try to get help with that. We are learning throughout our whole entire lives, and we can model that for our children, that they'll be learning for their entire lives. The things you don't know, the things you're not good at, you can learn and you can become better at them. And if you're modeling that in your life so that you can teach it to your child, then your child sees you modeling that and they'll know. You don't have to start out knowing everything, but you want to begin and start trying to learn the things that you need to learn. So any, anything you think you don't know, you can seek out people who can help you and they can help you to acquire teachings. They can help you to acquire methods of becoming a healthier person yourself. And then in seeing you doing healthy things and seeing you living a holistic life, then that will become normal for your child and your child will seek that in their own life. Yeah, and I think uh, when we say we, we need them to help ourselves, help each other as a mom or an auntie or an uncle, or you give them that good stroke, so how are you doing? You look really sharp today. You're a smart boy, you're a smart, I think giving them that identity of who they are. And as parents, sometimes we forget about that and we kind of want to get mad and we kind of want to shout and stuff. But if we give them the good strokes and say, oh, you're a cute one, you know, and uh, I always remember um, uh, I have I have my foster girls, eh? And uh, I've always encouraged them to be positive. You know, think think of how when you were a little girl, how you want your children to be, or how you were treated as a little girl, and you treat your children like that. So you give them that value again to live, to make them important. The children need to be very. I guess when we don't encourage them, they seem to wander and do things that they test us to, of how we want, they think they want to be. But if we continue to give them good positive strokes, you know, say, you're, oh, you're going to make it today. Like the little <coughs> girl, when I get home, and usually I'm away and the little girl says, Granny, I miss you. You know, it's so, always so powerful because we say that to them. We tell them, we miss you. We love you. We care about you. I want you to do this. I need you to do this. So you give them those positive at home 
uh, and uh, they take it with them every day. And, and I always say that, you know, you think positive, <coughs> talk positive, talk good to them, and, and don't, scold, don't scold them in public, you know. And, and those are some of the things I had always been told growing up. <coughs> <coughs> I believe that uh, the talk, the communication with the child is very important to build up on that. A lot of times in today's world or educational system, medical system, whatever, labels children and that locks them at a certain place. And I think we need to encourage them mm -hmm. with positive language, not discounting la language. And you can never uh, applaud them enough for the good things, the joy they bring, and everything. And I know uh, they used to say way back, even if a child killed a fly, it was time for a ceremony because that was their first kill. And all those little rites of passage were so important. And a lot of the, those rites of passages uh, are not there. So I believe it's really important when we develop programs to include those things that we have lost along the way. And uh, our children learn and I'd really bought memories back from teachings when Kathy was talking about the child in the cradle board. Mm -hmm. Because I know among the teachings the elders had was, you take the child, the, you go berry picking, the child goes. That child will be a berry picker, but not only a, a berry picker, but while <coughs> you're picking berries, they're learning from Mother Nature, mm -hmm. learning how to focus their eyes. Mm -hmm. A fly goes by and they're watching it. That's already learning for that uh, child. And uh, again, uh, looking at the fact that they are special. They bring a lot of teachings to us. A lot of awareness is where our shortfalls were. And when we had the traditional birthing systems that started right from when, again, at that conception, there was teachings there for the parents to always be happy. And if they said, if you're tense, you're gonna have a baby that's very tense. If you're happy, it's gonna be happy. So look after your emotional well-being, mm -hmm. your physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well-being. And I believe uh, they come to remind us to take care of ourselves, not only the parents of that child, but all of us, because we affect those little ones. Mm -hmm. And the best time for, um, or the most learning we do as uh, humans is the first seven years of our life. And those are such critical moments but we learn a lot from them, I certainly do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that goes back to uh, the teaching about when they come to us from uh, where they come from, they're with the Creator and they have the knowledge of everything. And when we get them, if we listen to them, like you're saying, Connie, and then believe them, then that gives them the confidence to try. My son used to, uh, he used to tell us when it was going to snow. And uh, he, I raised him in Oklahoma, so there wasn't really a lot of snow. But it was snow once in a while. And, and so one day he said, it smells like snow. But I didn't say, no, no, it's not going to snow. I said, oh, really? I said, okay, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. And the next day it did snow. There are gifts that the Creator gives us that are greater than we can even imagine. And our children have those gifts. And we don't want them to lose them because we don't believe in them. And that also carries on to when we're teaching them. We're not telling them, 
do it like this and this and then this and then this. We're saying, how do you think it would work? What do you think would be good? Try to do it the way you think is right. Mm -hmm. And so that they're always experimenting and they're finding out, well, what, what works good for them? Because what works for me may not be the same thing that can work for them mm -hmm. because each one is different. I was constantly pushing myself, come on, get ready, get to do this now, hurry up, we gotta do this, we're gonna leave pretty soon. And I thought, oh my gosh, am I gonna do this for the rest of my <laughs> life? And I thought, I can't, I can't do it for the rest of my life. And I decided I wasn't gonna push him anymore. I just know how long it takes him. And so I tell him we're gonna leave at this mm -hmm. time. So start getting ready. And I just give him enough time to get ready. And that worked a thousand times better, which is the other crazy thing about parenting. We also have to do that. We have to try to do it the best way we can. Mm -hmm. There's not just one way other people can tell you how to do it. You have to try. If something doesn't work, you have to be willing to try something mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to go to Head Start, one of the Head Start programs, and, and be to watch and observe as a grandmother. And what they were doing, uh, uh, you tell the, she told them that Head Start teacher told the little one to do something. And she said, no, I'm not doing that, she said. She grabbed herself. Eh? So I sat beside her and I took her hands and I said, you have such beautiful hands. Look at my hands. I said, they're old and brown. I told her, she looked and she was, and wrinkly. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, yours are just nice and smooth, I said. She chuckled and then after she went and started to play. But she was upset that morning. Uh, I don't know what happened at home, but you could feel the, whatever happened at home. I didn't bother asking, eh? I said, you have a good day, you know. She looked at me and she said, I will. So if you encourage the little ones, yeah, even the neighbor's kids, I always encourage them to come and play with the little ones and, and, and see them interact. Eh? It's the most important thing is they get them to interact so they choose their way. If they're upset, you will pick it up. Or if they're happy, you'll see them, how they dress. Or sometimes they come in just, you know, I'm tired, I didn't sleep well, you know. So you'll say, well, tonight you go to bed early, she always says, yeah. So those are kind of things you, I always say, you need to, they need to know that the everyday living is so, ch it's, changed so much from when we grew up. I grew up, I said, without parents. So I was always told, you have a good day. You're gonna do things good. I was always encouraged to do things like that because I was raised by my grandparents and you never, you don't see that respect in some of our children today. And that's sad, that's getting really sad. You have to teach them to respect each other. And someone's talking, listen to what they're saying, you know. And uh, I was always told that, you know, listen to what they're saying, and then you can learn from them, you know. So I want. I've worked in so many very interesting places. Part of my role at one point was. Uh, I was the first caseworker for the methadone program in Prince Albert. And I really believe it is a powerful program. However, we went too fast for too many. We couldn't handle. While there was a sm smaller group and you could handle it, it's very effective. But working with that group, it was almost starting from fresh and uh, we'd have healing circles and one of the things uh, was uh, reconnecting them in a good way with family. They were living with their children, but had been very disconnected. So I got them to bring their children in work as a family, play as a family. And I got the doctors to contribute money for them to go to the exhibition and take their children along and go on a rides with their children 
had a Christmas party for them, and that reconnection of those children with their parents was so important. And um, one of the, I got so many teachings. One of them told me one time, it's so great for people that work with young children to teach them good things. Unfortunately, when we've been addictions, there's things those little ones are learning. Told me, you don't know how many of our newborn babies or very young are pushed into bathrooms in their carriage or stroller as they watch adults putting a needle in. That's early childhood learning. We need to get, learn from that. We must always start from babyhood and uh, things like that. And when things, one of the uh, older ones uh, that had covered all the major city came in one day and said, I just want to give you a message to pass on to the future. He said, uh, there is no recreational drug. Those ones they call the recreational drug, especially the main one, leads to more. And look at the mess I'm in. And I don't want other people to be there. So start with the little ones. Give them a part and give them that sense of belonging, that sense of being loved, all the things that are essential needs of individuals.